Good morning, and thank you all for coming. I'm Steve Morrison from CSIS, the Center for Global Health Policy. Uh, this is part of our um, ongoing uh, speaker series uh, here at CSIS, in which we've attempted to find uh, and, and enlist many of the, uh, of the leading voices in global health from across a spectrum of issue areas, uh, opinion leaders, and, and those who are uh, the, the strategic thinkers come and, uh, and give us uh, concise, focused presentations on topics that we think are terribly important. And today, uh, we, are, uh, we are very blessed to have Seth Berkeley, Dr. Seth Berkeley, uh, with us here. And I will say a, a word in a moment about Seth's background and how uh, we'll be using this time. One housekeeping item uh, for your attention. Um, uh, later today at 2 p.m., uh, we'll be joined by Dr. James Hakim, who's chairman of the Department of Medicine at the University of Zimbabwe and the College of Health Sciences in Harare to speak about the, uh, uh, the conditions, health conditions, and status of the medical infrastructure, health infrastructure in Zimbabwe. As you know, an ongoing um, cholera epidemic there. Um, many big issues at play. Uh, and so Dr. Hakim will be with us at 2 p.m. here um, at CSIS. Please join us if you can. Seth we, is known to, to uh, I'm sure, to all of you uh, in the room here. He's the president and founder of the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, I IAVI. He's a medical doctor specializing in infectious disease epidemiology and international health, and he's an indefatigable uh, contributor to debates and to uh, keeping uh, very important issues at the forefront of discussion, writing editorials, delivering speeches, creating new institutions that uh, further expand the reach and capacities of IAVI and the like. Um, he has been at IAVI since founding it in 96. Prior to that, was the Associate Director of the Health Sciences Division at the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, he's an adjunct professor of public health at Columbia University and adjunct professor of medicine at Brown. Uh, comes with his undergraduate medical degrees from Brown and trained in internal medicine at Harvard University. Uh, he's worked at the Center for Infectious Diseases at USCDC, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, and the Carter Center, where he was assigned as an epidemiologist at the Ministry of Health in Uganda. He's the author of over 85 publications, has written extensively on infectious disease. Uh, as I said earlier, he is an, a very recognizable and esteemed opinion leader uh, across a spectrum of issues around infectious diseases, health technology, development, tying all of these things towards long-term benefits, AIDS, and international health. We've asked Seth to do a couple of things today. We thought it was appropriate for him to come and give us an update on the core business that concerns IAVI, the development of vaccine for HIV AIDS, status of efforts. It's been a, it's been a, it's, 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 a, it's always a difficult and confusing subject area that Seth is particularly good at illuminating, giving us a sense of where, where the key moments are right now in the development of new technologies and what, what lies ahead uh, in the future. And the second part that, that is a subject that Seth has taken the lead in trying to get us to think more clearly is around the question of building scientific research capacity in developing countries, in partner developing countries, so that, so that we overcome that gap and so that the, 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 the project, the enterprise, of seeking new vaccines and other technological tools becomes more significantly embedded within a long-term developmental process in which these countries themselves are invested and benefiting and contributing. These are two big topics, and Seth, I realize it's going to take a, few, a little bit. Of, they're, they're not simple topics or short, short topics, but please, thank you so much for coming with us today. The floor is yours. Uh, after you're completed, we'll, we'll move to some questions and comments uh, from our audience. So welcome. Thank you, Thank you so much. Maybe 
So thank you so much for the brave who come out on a Monday morning to see this talk. Um, you've already heard what I'm going to try to do, so let me go ahead and jump right into it and then uh, make sure we have lots of times for questions at the end. Um, just to remind you, I don't think I have to remind this particular audience um, that HIV hasn't gone away. I mean, and, and one of the problems is that we hear a lot about how, you know, with treatment it can be controlled, it's just a chronic disease, but it still is having a dramatic effect around the world, and women are bearing the brunt of the epidemic, now representing almost 60 percent of the people infected in, um, uh, in Africa and, and half the adults worldwide. And so this continues to be a major problem despite what some of the pundits are saying. And when we think about an AIDS vaccine, and I'm going to come back to you know, where we are with it, um, the, the critical issue is, is that we've got to deal with today's interventions. We've got to you know, have the tools we have. We've got to get them out. We've got to prevent further spread of the virus. Right now, for every two people put on treatment, there are five new infections. We must slow that down. We've got to treat everybody we can who's already infected, and we have to mitigate the societal impacts. But if we are going to be successful, we've got to create new tools. And so this means an investment in innovation for new technologies, and we'll talk in a second about what those are. And it's critical to keep in mind that if we're going to meet this universal goal of, of access for all by 2010, you need better prevention. AIDS vaccines is the best of these, but um, otherwise we're not going to meet that commitment. And so when we think about the, 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 the toolkit that's required, in black are the, the, uh, tool, the tools that we have today, and red are tools that are under development. Some of these have had studies that have been negative and people have gone back to the drawing board. But I think the, the point to take away from this is that this is the way we have to think about it. It isn't one intervention, it's a whole range of interventions. And what's critical is that you've got to have them prior to exposure at the point of transmission and after infection. And, and a lot of new stuff's going to happen in the next few years. Preventative vaccines, we'll talk about what's happening. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, there's going to be new data coming out later this year on that, and, and that may be a game changer in terms of, of uh, how we use that, what we do with it in the, in the North and the South. Um, microbicides, you've heard there's been positive data um, in, in clinical trials in humans, a relatively modest effect, 30 percent, um, but that should be validated in, in upcoming studies, and there's next generations of those. And, and obviously, there's a continued research on ways to deal with the integrated virus. Could you actually learn how to cure people with HIV? And we're not anywhere close to that, but that would obviously be a game changer as well. So this is really the toolkit that we're talking about. And, 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 and a vaccine would really change, you know, in a sense, a lot of things. Now, it, you might look at this graph of where the world is on, on infections, and you see it going down so dramatically. That is assuming that we get universal access, that everybody has preventive technologies, that everybody's on treatment. And even in that circumstance, uh, a vaccine would have a dramatic effect, including with a relatively ineffective vaccine. So one of the challenges for us is to make sure that we keep at this. And, um, and the first vaccine may not be perfect, but it may have implications for use in, in a very high risk groups. And then, of course, you want to continue to improve it until we get a high impact vaccine. vaccine. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about science, but I can't not talk a little bit about it. So this cartoon just uh, says to you there are two major uh, ways that, that one can deal with um, an infectious organism um, uh, and the immune system. Uh, neutralizing antibodies is the traditional way vaccines work. Um, this is how you can get sterilizing immunity, very specific. Cell-mediated immunity is a way um, the immune system uh, deals with a, a, an infectious organism that has already gotten into the body is reproducing, and what it does is it goes in and kills the cells that are infected with this. So these are the two mechanisms, and I'll tell you why that's important in a second. So obviously, why would we be talking about AIDS vaccines? Well, I think the most important thing to say is an AIDS vaccine is possible. We know that immune control is, a, is, is possible. The majority of people are able to suppress viral load. What happens is people get infected, they get a high viremia, and then the virus load comes down and stays down for a very long period of time, sometimes 15, 20 years, sometimes longer. And during that period, that is the immune system controlling it. We also know that there are populations resistant to HIV infection. There's long-term non-progressors, there's highly exposed uninfected, children of infected mothers obviously all don't get infected. But as important, there is experimental candidates 
there are experimental candidates that um, protect. And so if you take the, the, the best model we have today, it isn't a perfect model, but the best, which is the simian immunodeficiency virus, which is a virus that affects um, uh, monkeys, and you go ahead and use a live attenuated, live weakened vaccine, you can get complete protection of a rigorous challenge. Um, you also, um, if you take neutralizing antibodies that um, uh, neutralize a broad range of strains and you put them in macaques, you can get sterilizing immunity. So we have animal data, we have human data that immune, that immune protection is possible. This is why we're optimistic. There's also been a huge change, and, and um, you know, if you go back to where we were 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of interest in AIDS vaccines. Um, we now have a lot of people who care a lot about this and an enormous amount of political commitment. We've also had a huge increase in spending. So um, the world started out at about um, uh, $150 million globally. That's public and private sector. You can see here a graph of where the world is today, 960 million. Hard to say that all of that is, is directed really at kind of product development. There's a lot of stuff that is thrown into you know, this, this overall budget for HIV vaccines. But what's important, if you see here, is that the United States is the is the largest funder by far. In fact, one of the, you know, the public policy challenges we have is to try to engage other governments in the degree that the U.S. government is engaged. And, and most of this, of course, is the U.S. NIH, which is, of course, the largest biomedical research funder in the world. So a big change, um, you see on the bottom that pharmaceutical companies really do not put a lot of money into this. Um, they did initially. They realized that this was a a, a, a product mostly going to be for the developing world, politically controversial um, and um, difficult science. And as a result of all of that, they've pulled away from it and are really waiting um, for a breakthroughs before they enter the game in a big way. So those are some of the good news things. The bad news is, is that finding a vaccine is really tough. And, and there are a whole bunch of science challenges. I'm not going to go into great detail. but. Um, this virus um, integrates in, in the chromosome and, and attacks the very immune system that needs to protect it. It's highly variable. Um, if you look at if flu was my fist in terms of variability, we know that flu varies, you know, HIV would be, you know, the size of this room and uh, enormously variable. Um, we still don't really fully understand the immune correlates of protection. We don't have a perfect animal model. And as a result, you've got to go into humans, and that makes clinical trials long and costly. So we're tackling an aggressive and fast-moving target. We have to test it in people, and success is going to take time. We, we like to say it's a marathon, not a sprint. But it's not just science. It's, it's policy and political will. Because of that, we've got to have not only a long-term effort, which requires a long-term commitment, but it has to be global. Why? We need the best science in the world, not just the best science in the U.S. or in Canada or in France. It has to be the best in the world. We need to have incentives for industry. We need to understand the regulatory issues and ethical issues and intellectual property issues, make sure we have a good environment for those, and obviously the challenges in the health system. So sustain political support, private sector engagement, and optimize the environment. This is what is required to get there. Um, we put out a blueprint. Some of you I saw were reading it. It's outside, or at least a summary of it. And what we talked about are really the three waves that have occurred of, of AIDS vaccine development. So to start with, when this agent appeared in the early 1980s, we had just finished with a hepatitis B vaccine. Everybody said, aha, we have hepatitis B model. We'll just make this like hepatitis B. We'll, we'll go ahead and take a small piece of the outer part of the envelope and make a vaccine with it. And, and that's really what happened. A lot of investment went on that. And, and although 100 percent of people got antibodies to that particular va uh, vaccine, um, uh, the problem was because of all the variability, it didn't work against the strains that were circulating. So um, despite this, a, a charismatic and wonderful leader said it was safe, we should test it, and um, there was an efficacy trial of this product, and that really ended the sense that this particular product and, and neutralizing antibodies um, in, 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 of these types of products were, were where we were going to go. The next phase really started after that. Um, people said, we don't know how to do antibodies yet, but we're going to do cellular immunity. They took about 30 vaccines forward. Um, again, there wasn't a perfect animal model, so they decided to go to large-scale efficacy trials. This also had the beginning of an effort really to engage on some of the key science challenges. And at the end of this was the Merck candidate failure, um, which you all heard about. And this really ended the second wave. And, and let me just point out that there's only been two vaccine trials in efficacy, despite what you hear about all the failures. Um, 
Finally, um, harnessing innovation is where what we're calling the third wave. This is really trying to hone in, go upstream a little bit, solve some of the major scientific challenges. Um, one of the things is since we have to go into humans, how do, we, how do we think about doing trials differently to make them quick and iterative rather than slow and, and uh, long and expensive? Um, harnessing innovation, and I'll talk a lot about that, and, and, and getting the next generation of scientists. So this may sound obvious, but the next major advance in AIDS vaccine development is going to be showing protection in humans of an HIV vaccine. So even if the protection isn't very robust, it will then allow us to validate the animal model. So as a result, what we really want to do is design, develop, and advance the efficacy trials candidates that elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies. So not just one strain, broadly neutralizing and controls HIV as well as in the monkey model, this SIV vaccine protects it. And we're particularly interested in, in vaccines that can get um, protection on the mucosa because it is mostly transmitted, as you know, by you know, anal intercourse, by vaginal intercourse. Obviously, we also have to pay attention to IV drug use, but most of the transmission is through mucosal membrane. And um, I'm going to talk about replicating vectors. And, and lastly, one of the things that came out of this Merck trial was that we really don't have good assays. We need better ways to measure immunity. And so there's a whole uh, role to try to get um, better assays. So with that, where is the uh, AIDS vaccine pipeline? There have been two efficacy trials, as I said. There is a third efficacy trial that's ongoing. Um, uh, Data is probably going to be in the third quarter. This is a huge trial, 15,000 people in Thailand. Um, I've got to say the field is pretty um, negative on the possibilities of this being a, a big success. Obviously, we all hope that there's some uh, signal here because that would give us a clue. It is a combination of a, of a vaccine called Allvac, a canary pox, and the VaxGen vaccine that's listed above that had no efficacy. Um, why, are, why is the community uh, somewhat less uh, uh, optimistic about this? Allvac doesn't, is not a very potent vector. It only gave strong immune responses in about 30 percent of people. As we've already said, the GP120 did not work, tested alone. So most people feel the combination is unlikely to be a really robust combination, but we'll see. There's a range of other candidates that are ongoing, and, and some of these should move into um, uh, some type of uh, a trial, screening test of concept trials. But what's important is there's no um, candidates in trials that are producing broadly neutralizing antibodies or a combination of the two, which is really what you'd like to have, because you'd like to have a vaccine that can you know, get it right away, and if it doesn't work, then one that could mop up cells that got infected. Now, what's really exciting now, and we're really entering a renaissance, is the following. I'm not going to go into the detail of the science, but I list six different approaches here. These are all in monkeys. And all six of these approaches look better than the Merck candidate. Now, again, that doesn't guarantee success, but what we've got is a whole range of new candidates. And the challenge is going to be how to accelerate these and drive these forward as fast as possible. There also are real big advances in neutralizing antibodies. I'm going to talk about that in detail. Um, and finally, um, there is work now to create better assays that will allow us to predict because we've got a lot of candidates we're going to have to decide what to move forward with. And so if you think about it in a schematic fashion, this is really what it looks like. On the, on the left is solving the neutralizing antibody problem, is getting some immunogens, getting you know, one or a few out into a vaccine, and then, and then getting a bunch of vaccine platforms on the right. And, and again, having one come out and bringing them together into a vaccine and, and, and obviously going through a whole series of steps to prioritize those and make sure that those are going to work. So let me just say a word about IAVI because I'm going to mix it up now on what's IAVI and what's the field. But um, uh, our mission is to ensure the development of a safe, effective, accessible, preventive HIV vaccine for use throughout the world. Ensure is critical because the, this, this type of mission means that we don't care who succeeds. So if Merck is going to you know, move forward a candidate, why should we move the same, same candidate forward? So we think of the field as a portfolio, and then we try to move into higher risk approaches or things that, that, that uh, um, we, we, we think we can add value. Um, as a result, our, our core principles are, one, we focus only on preventive HIV vaccines. Um, speed is our focus, so if we have to trade off investments, we Going fast is more important than necessarily um, trying to take the most economical route if it means stretching it out over a very long time. The, the flexibility of being a, a small not-for-profit allows us to jump on something if it's exciting, drop something if it's not. Willingness to take informed risk will often take 
products forward that industry might say, well, regulatory-wise, it's too hard for us, or intellectual property isn't quite wrapped up. And then finally, access is always a part of our mission. And um, we move across the whole chain. Um, we have an integrated model of R&D. And um, it's interesting, we're, we're operating now at about $105 million a year, 250 people. But if you include who's working in Africa, we're about 1,000 people. And there's a lot of people in our African and India sites not working directly for IAVI, but working for our partner organizations and fully being paid for. And these are, these are the, the uh, people doing the trials and the laboratory technicians and nurses and counselors and outreach people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, this idea of product development, public-private partnerships really were started around the contraceptive area. Um, IAVI started in 96, and since then there's been a whole range of them. Um, there's also a group of, um, below the line, are other uh, public-private partnerships working on health issues. And uh, the reason I wanted to put this up, I know that um, you guys are policy wonks, and I think it's important to think about this mechanism of, of ways of working. Um, there are more drugs and vaccines and diagnostics for diseases of poverty now in the pipeline than ever before, and this movement is responsible for most of them. And it's interesting because IAVI started as an advocacy organization. It then moved into gap-filling uh, science, it then started to do serious vaccine development when we had enough money and credibility to do that, but we did it virtually. We realized that if you work with small biotech companies, they don't necessarily have the expertise. So we ended up uh, staffing across the entire value chain and bringing people from industry, and not in depth. We don't have like Merck's regulatory department, but what we've got are people with each of the skills. We then moved into having validated laboratories because we wanted to make sure that any study we did anywhere in the world was the same and could be compared to any other. We then set up a professional policy program because we thought this was critical. Um, applied Research Consortium I'll talk about, and most recently we've created our own laboratories. This is an interesting transition, um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see how some of the other product development partnerships go through a transition like this. And, and it's something that is, is going to be debated out there and I think is, is quite important. Um, we're very different than a typical public sector organization uh, uh, or even um, a, a funder. And, and I guess that the closest correlate in the federal government would be the Vaccine Research Center of NIH. So let me just take you into depth again. I don't want to talk about the science, but I want to talk about how you can really work on a problem like this. So uh, the neutralizing antibody challenge is that this is how most vaccines work. We know that you can protect with this in an animal model, and we know that humans can make broadly neutralizing antibodies. And, and down here, these things with letters on them are, there are four known broadly neutralizing antibodies. They're, they're not incredibly potent, but they work. People can make them, so we know that people can make the right type of antibodies. And what we did is we started off with a small group, four institutions, and that's grown now to 16 institutions around the world that are working together they share science, they share data, they also share intellectual property in an interesting way. Those um, institutions agree that the inventor of a new um, idea, uh, technology, will get a, a higher level that everybody else shares in it, and there'll be access for the developing world of any technologies that are developed. So it's an interesting model. Um, and, and the challenge has been, this has been something that's been done in people's laboratories, you know, a couple of lab techs, going slow, and how do you turn this into a high throughput? This is what industry does for drugs, but hasn't been done for vaccines before, for biologics. So, broken it down into some of the challenges. If there's four neutralizing antibodies, there's probably more. So, protocol G, I'll talk about that in a second, get some more. We then said, okay, how do you do the structure? This is a really slow process. We built a custom high throughput robot at the Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla. Very expensive, but this can do the work of, you know, an army of graduate students in, in, in a week. And so you can really move through in a high throughput fashion. The third would be once you've got the, the structure, you've got the antibodies, now you want to try to make potential vaccines that will induce those antibodies. And how do you do that? Well, we went to India. We said, look, in India they're making a lot of medicinal chemistry, particularly for generics. They're not doing it so much on biologics, but there's a lot of them available, so we got a group of them together, some companies, to try to work on, on focusing full-time on image and design. There's also being done across the NAC and the Innovation Fund, which I'll talk about. And then finally, once you've got a lot of these image engines, you're making hundreds of them, how do you test them? Well, 
an interesting company, Vax Design, is trying to create a immune system on a, on a, in a Petri dish, basically, so you could at least do some of the screening. So this is the challenge. How do you do high throughput? And um, this hasn't been done before, but this will, the reason I'm so optimistic, I'll show you in a second. So we said, all right, if there's more, if there's lots of antibodies, let's go out. And we, we went across the world, 2,000 people infected more than three years, and it turns out that um, about 10% of them have broad neutralizing antibodies. We don't know if it's one or multiple, and even more interesting, about 1% are elite neutralizers. These are people who have very potent serum. And um, we've just um, uh, isolated our first two new broad neutralizing antibodies out of these people, and they're very much more potent than the old ones. And so we're you know, hard at work now beginning to look at how to turn those into an immunogen. Now, the reason that's exciting is it isn't going to be just two. There's going to be a whole new toolkit of potential antibody structures that can help us really drive forward trying to solve this problem. And so um, this is really, really exciting. Um, um, I mentioned before this idea of, uh, of, a, of a replicating um, a virus in monkeys. If you look down on the bottom of the chart, in blue is a cartoon of what a live attenuated um, uh, monkey um, AIDS uh, vaccine looks like. So you get a little blip of virus and then sterilizing immunity goes away. And interestingly, if you look at the typical course in a monkey, it goes up, it comes down a little bit, and you have a, you know, a high level of viral load, and those monkeys tend to die. If you take that, um, that replicating but weakened vector and you turn it into a one-cycle replicant, so it just replicates once, it actually ends up in the middle there. So there's something about replication that matters. Now, why is that important? Well, up until now, we haven't moved replicating vectors forward in the AIDS vaccine space, mostly because people have been concerned about uh, safety, and obviously the less things replicate, the less live they are, the safer they are. And so most of the work has been on the left side of the chart here. Um, we, nobody would move the ones on the top that are, in, that are in brown up there. Nobody would talk about taking a live attenuated um, HIV vaccine forward because if, if it reverted to wild type, you'd be infecting somebody with a fatal disease. That little space in the middle, replicating viral vectors, we think is where the sweet spot is. And that's where we're focusing our effort now um, on trying to move candidates forward that will look like these SIV vaccines but have the safety profile that allows them to be used. This is, again, a, from a regulatory point of view, a, a riskier place to be. And so what we're doing is moving a whole bunch of these forward and then, you know, based upon scientific hypotheses, and, and then, you know, can we make them? Do they work in small animals? Do they work in the non-human non primate model and pick the best one of these? So this is kind of the technique of how to move forward in a systematic way. Um, IAVI tries to, and I'm going to come to the, the, the other part of the talk now, I'm going to begin to interface it. We believe fundamentally to do this type of work, you have to work in the developing world, but you've got to do it as real partners. And this is more of a development approach than it is a parachute research approach. It's building long-term relationships. It's, it's getting them engaged in access. It's creating an enabling environment for research so that they feel they own it and that, that it's, you know, they're part of the team to do this. And, and this is important because, you know, as you can imagine, there's a reluctance to be involved in research unless you feel the benefits are going to be there for you. So um, this is something we've been doing for a while. Um, it's also critical to bring developing countries to the global call for investment. And, and um, you know, we've had, for example, AIDS vaccines have been declared a national goal in India, uh, president of Uganda, Rwanda, South Africa. Even with all the problems in South Africa, they supported vaccines. So how do you really keep this kind of dialogue going and engaging them? And that includes both at the local community level where, you know, you've got to work with people to do trial-type design. It also includes adapting, um, you know, the – each country learning from each other and are adapting both on you know, how to train staff, how to do vaccine literacy, um, how to do the leadership, working with vulnerable populations is a big deal. When I lived in Africa, it was not known that there were, there were clusters of men who have sex with men, for example, in Africa. We now have a cluster in Kenya, north of uh, Mombasa, large cluster, very high incidence of men who have sex with men. And it's unbelievable the stigma that's associated there. I mean, we brought the researchers from the community there, and the researchers didn't even want to deal with it. So um, it's something that really training has to go on. Um, and an example of, of, of how proud we are of this, this is a, um, in Uganda, a, a clinic site. Uh, we rebuilt and put a, a clinic there. 
Um, afterwards, um, they did multiple phase one trials and showed that they could do them fast. They expanded to field sites. And, and amazingly, they not only validated their laboratory, but then went ahead and got it accredited and now is a, a worldwide reference laboratory for the Gates Foundation's network. So, you know, for me, one of the most extraordinary things is to see how these researchers can become engaged and do work that's as good or higher quality. I didn't, I didn't put it up because it's a very technical slide, but we recently had a QAQC program across the world and lined up all the different sites, and the ones in Africa did better than the ones, I won't name them, in Europe and some of them in the United States. So, I mean, it's a really interesting thing from when 10 years ago people said you couldn't do these types of trials in the developing world. And the good news now is that, you know, if you look at, that, at where the infection is, there's now a lot more trials. At the beginning, there was an engagement. Now there really is a global effort to try to move AIDS vaccines forward. Um, one of the problems, though, with the slowdown in science is scientists alone can't solve the problem. But how do you keep people engaged when, uh, the, when the pipeline slows down? So how do we sustain that capacity? You know, we've had this debate. Do we drop sites? you know, during this time period? And the answer is, this is the most valuable thing. People who have experience doing trials, so we're doing everything we can to make sure we keep sites going and keep them engaged in research, keep any communities engaged, um, uh, and not over-promised. We, we probably did a bad job at the beginning. People got overexcited. You know, they thought, my God, you know, vaccine's going to be right here. Um, how do we have that advocacy platform go on? And, and and, you know, what can this do to move forward capacity in these countries? So these are some of the questions we're answering. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein, uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting uh, different results. So we really have to drive forward innovation now. And this is some of the toughest science that we've ever had to deal with. So how do we do it at IAVI? Well, I've mentioned these consortia. I mentioned one, but there's a bunch of them. Um, We've now built a laboratory that can move things that industry won't move, an innovation fund, which is a really interesting um, concept. And we've done this jointly with the Gates Foundation. This preceded their setting up their, their, their new innovation fund. Um, and the idea there is to go to companies that are not working in HIV vaccines, have no interest in working in HIV vaccines, look for technologies that might be useful and bring them in. And we do that working with a group of venture capitalists who help us identify them and then help us convince the management team that we should do that. We've also uh, worked uh, with Innocentive and put prizes on the, on the web and, and uh, really trying to change the way one does clinical trials. And, and this is the laboratory that I told you about. Um, we just moved in in October. It's a beautiful BSL-3 laboratory, 36,000 feet with really unlimited growth potential. And it's, you know, a whole new thing. It's an industrial style but not-for-profit applied research laboratory that's just dedicated to this cause. And we're looking at how we link this laboratory to laboratories in India, South Africa, other places to really try to, to get scientists engaged in, in, in accelerating this. Um, let me just uh, finish moving into the policy realm uh, a little bit. Um, there's a range of policy issues that get raised when we talk about the science. Obviously, at the end of the day, we have to have adequate resources. We've got to target funds strategically. We've got to engage the private sector. We've got to push innovation. Um, and, and so IAVI's policy team is working on all of these. For um, a lot of the, the engagement part, we use a push-pull strategy. And, and um, um, you know, Gavi has been key here in terms of of uh, working on advanced market commitments and, and uh, some of these, uh, you know, the IFM long-term funding strategies. Um, and, and so one of the challenges is how do, we, how do we work with these, how do we work with others on this? The, uh, the uh, FDA vouchers that just came out, another mechanism. So there's a lot of innovation that's going on in this space. It's not directed right now at, um, at uh, AIDS vaccines. And how do we make sure it is? Because AIDS vaccines are important, but they're longer timeline. And so that's one of the real challenges for us. And, We've been having a set of conversations on the innovative financing. Um, remember, I showed you that chart of all the product development public-private partnerships. We've been working with the malaria vaccine people and the TB vaccine people to ask the question, are there ways to create innovative funding mechanisms that are not just yearly? Some of our donors are multiple year, but many of our donors are single year. So I go around every year with a cup. And that's hard to support long-term financing of research, particularly in the developing world. So some of the ideas that have been talked about is adding R&D windows in, in the Global Fund or Gavi or Unitaid, um, having an, an industry-type fund, 
um, neglected R&D funds, um, some public uh, sector bonds like uh, the IFM we used, and so these are being investigated as different mechanisms. Um, I mentioned the innovation fund that, that uh, we had. Uh, we've done a number of different awards to uh, companies out there. We have a number more that are coming out now. And, and this is really an interesting mechanism to engage new players. But this is very labor intensive because it's not RFPs. This is proactively going out, you know, reaching out to venture capitalists, saying, what companies do you know that might have something, and then talking to them and figuring it out. And we've gone to hundreds of companies for the small numbers that we've pulled out. But we already have um, uh, Spaltadec, which has been renamed Theraclone, is the, is the company that isolated these two new broadly neutralizing antibodies. So already we're beginning to see some, some uh, success from this. So just to summarize and, and, and to give you an idea of what, a, what we can do as a, P, as a product development public-private partnership, we're actually now the second large AIDS vaccine and design and development program working in 25 countries. Our management team, all of them come from the vaccine industry. We have a network of uh, global labs and research centers and a lot of accomplishment. First vaccine trials in a number of countries, trials in 11 countries. First vaccines designed for Africa, seven, seven novel candidates from concept to clinic, first accredited human immunology lab, our neutralizing antibody consortium solved the existing neutralizing antibodies, but now has identified new ones, and these new labs are coming out. So a lot of success for the model. But to remind everybody, we're a little teeny player compared to the rest of them. So for us, the challenge is to use speed, efficiency, and the willingness to take calculated risks to be able to leverage and, and make our money go further than it would from, uh, from uh, our proverbial share of the pie. Um, lastly, let me just end with a couple of comments on, on, on the human development aspects of this. And we know that reversing the spreads of AIDS is one of the eight um, uh, Millennium Development Goals, um, and we know why for the things it does. But I just want to bring up another point to you, and that is if you think about what's happened, the AIDS activist community have been very successful at getting funding for AIDS, and, and here's what um, uh, um, has been suggested is required for the amazing commitment at Glen Equals to provide universal access by 2015, $54 billion a year. And if you, if you take that and kind of think about what that would look like in 2007, it's about 10 percent for AIDS. By 2010, it would be 33 percent for AIDS. It would actually, you know, the calculations aren't clear on what ODA is going to look like in 2015, but some calculations take it up to 50 percent. It's not likely to happen, and we, I think we all understand that. But one of the challenges, unless we create new tools, we have created now a, a long-term program that you can't stop. You can't stop treatment funding. So we've really created a, a, um, a program that is going to challenge all of us in, in the ups and downs of financing. And so not only is it the right thing to do, but economically we've got to deal with creating better tools. And, and for me, science and technology is an incredibly important tool. Not only is it a global public good and it fills a critical need in terms of saving lives and improving health, et cetera, but it's also one of the best forms of development aid. Um, if you think about it, and, and Steve and I were talking about this before, you know, in the old days, you'd go in, you'd build dams, you'd build roads, you'd, you know, you'd build infrastructure. Well, countries can do that now. In fact, if they, even if they can't, other developing countries can come in and do it for them. But Malawi is not going to be able to make an AIDS vaccine. It's not going to be able to do the biotechnology to create a new seed strain. And so one of the best things we can do is use our comparative advantage, which is science and technology, and get our scientists engaging in these problems. Um, in addition to that, obviously working on research in those countries where they can, having exchange of science and technology across the borders. And one of the things that really does that's important is it, it stops brain drain. If you have good scientists that now are doing important work, they'll stay and then they become role models and that's really important. And obviously as they're there and new scientists get trained, then they have the capacity to move forward. And no country has really been able to kind of move into the industrial age without building their own science and development base. So, we think this is a really important uh, argument. So at the end, a preventive vaccine is the only way to end the AIDS epidemic. Um, obviously, I have to thank our donors, which um, you know, have been extraordinary in supporting the flexibility of, of this organization, the, um, the, the speed and, and uh, way we've been working. Um, we're, we're supported by governments around the world, private individuals and foundations. And I think I'll stop there, open it for questions.
Sure, my name's David Schoen. Thank you, Dr. Berkeley. It was a fantastic presentation. Um, one quick statement, then a question. Just looking at the therapeutic vaccine side, we now have published data showing a vaccine that in a phase two trial has kept people off of ARVs for up to five years and um, has uh, uh, a an average patient response of 31 months without antiretrovirals. And I'm wondering why uh, you wouldn't move your organization into the therapeutic side. And if you can comment on that, thanks. My name, okay. My name is Dan Leifer. I'm a student at Stanford University. I was curious, um, there's some scientific literature coming out that shows that, or it suggests that antiretrovirals reduce the virulence of the AIDS virus. I'm curious why you don't focus some of your research focus towards that. Reduce the what? I'm sorry. The, the virulence. The virulence. Okay. Thank you. Others? In terms of an investment in a in a development strategy, um, as a public good, as something that is is is. is to involve a long-term investment in communities and building up skills and jobs and capacity. That, how do you make that case in our system here where the, ba the boundary lines have been drawn differently? It's, it's, it requires you, to, requires you to, to move folks to think in quite different fashions around institutions and committees and funding streams and authorities. And that. If you could talk about that a bit. Should I jump into those maybe and then we'll do another set? Okay, on the therapeutic vaccine side, I believe that at the end of the day, the way we'll deal with the large number of infected people out there are through therapeutic vaccines. Why did we not jump on it? There's a number of reasons. One is there is a market out there for therapeutic vaccines. There's a lot of money that's been invested in therapeutics in general and corporations are interested in moving forward with therapeutic vaccines. They may not be funding as generously as we'd all like, but there is a place one could go. Secondly, one of the real dangers early on was that people would test a vaccine therapeutically. It's much easier because you're testing it in people who are sick versus healthy, and the regulatory system allows that to occur quicker. If it didn't work in that setting, then people would throw out the vaccine. They would say, well, you know, now to take it back in and do a preventive trial. And so, you know, on the other hand, obviously, if it worked, it would be fabulous, but that's, that's one of the second issues for us. And third really was that, you know, the greatest need is, is in creating new prevention tools because, you know, you've got now six odd billion people out there, you know, many who are going to be at risk sometime in their lives. And how do you deal with um, prevention for that large population? And so the combination of all those three said, let us focus in on, on prevention, but I think therapeutic vaccines are a really important area. And ultimately, once you prove that a vaccine works and you know how to do an immune response, certainly you'll want to go back, probably treat people really aggressively, drive the virus load down, and then be able to you know, get the immune uh, response back up and then be able to withdraw um, uh, a therapy because obviously there's a problem with trying to have therapy going for a long time. Um, in terms of the roles of treatment, it, it's really complicated and interesting. We're actually going to do a small pre-exposure prophylaxis study, an intermittent pre-exposure prophylaxis study. And one of the things we'll look at there is what is the immune response of people when they have exposure to a virus and are on antiretrovirals? Do they get boosts in their immune system? May this be a way to trigger a more effective uh, immune response? And, and those are important questions. Um, you know, the problem with drugs, although they certainly keep people alive, um, you can still transmit virus even though you're on drugs. And one of the interesting things is a lot of different compartments. So what happens in the, you know, in, in, in the semen is different than what occurs in the blood, is different than what occurs on the mucosal surface, different than what occurs in the brain. And so people are just beginning to understand now the compartments and how things move. And so it isn't, I mean, people have thought, gee, if you just treat people, and there's a discussion, treatment is prevention, then the epidemic should go away. Now, it may be that that works, but if you think about the U.S. experience, we had no treatment, and then over the last decade, most people get put on treatment. And if you look at what's happened to numbers of infections, CDC increased the number, but not because the 
infections increased because they had a better count, but we've basically been stable. So you've gone from no treatment up to virtually 100 percent, and you're still operating at about, you know, 60-odd, you know, 1,000 infections a year, suggesting that treatment is not a major way to work as prevention. But I think that needs a lot more studies and certainly has been interesting in modeling. Um, Steve's question on, on science and technology, that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the issues is that, you know, our science and technology community, it's our engine of development. And I think the number is something like um, um, uh, venture capital is 0.7 percent of investments, but it's something like, you know, v VC-driven companies is like 15 to 20 percent of U.S. output. I mean, it's a really important part of what we do. And, and how do we get the government to think differently about, you know, science and technology as part of development policy, as part of diplomacy? Certainly it becomes an issue on intellectual property. I mean, you know, there's been huge battles fought over that. But it's a, it's a much broader conversation. In the science community, of course, science is global. But it, it hasn't, it hasn't um, moved into the developing world the way it should. And one of the things that's been really tough is that, um, and I am for this, the single most important development thing we can do is mother's education. So it's, it's early education, you know, primary education for mothers, the best. So that's something that we're all focused on. And as a result, people have moved away from tertiary education. You know, it used to be that there were a lot of institutions that invested in universities and, you know, high-tech education. And a lot of politically that moved away for a while. It's beginning to come back. But I think that's a really important question. And how do you make sure that there are people to train the next generations, the leaders, you know, the educators um, to do the high level work that's going to be needed to transition these, these, these countries. So you're absolutely right. It's broader than AIDS vaccines. It's broader than just science and technology. It's broader than health. It's, it's a much, you know, more, uh, you know, much more different com conversation. And, and um, Alex just walked out, but, um, you know, Gavi is focused on vaccines. You know, governments should fund their immunization programs 100%. Then donors could come in and say, we'll fund your universities. What tends to happen is donors say, we're not interested in universities, we're only interested in immunizations. So they fund immunizations, and then, you know, governments end up funding universities and don't do it adequately. And so, you know, how we rethink our whole structure, I think, is a really, really interesting question. Please. Thanks. My name's Janet Fleischman. With, um, I do a lot of the work on gender for the Center for Global Health Policy. And I'd love you to address some of the issues that IAVI has confronted in terms of getting women on some of the trials. I know that early on you had some of the issues, the, the very social and economic reasons that women have had trouble accessing treatment or, or adhering to treatment, and I wonder if you could speak to that and where you're at now. And secondly, if you have time to just address the new uh, Obama administration global health budget and some of the issues that seem to be arising in terms of treatment versus prevention and some of the broader global health uh, priorities that are out there, and how do you see uh, ways that we can make better arguments for the broader prevention agenda, which, as you've noted, is critical to sustaining this in the long term. Great. Yes. Jennifer Cook with the Africa program here at CSIS. I had a question. I was interested to hear you say that, you know, momentum and enthusiasm is still extremely high uh, on, on vaccine development. And I wonder, would you say that's broad, you know, popular support, congressional support, or a kind of within the community? Because, you know, there were the high-profile failures, if you want to call them that, um, f for a vaccine that may be partially effective, and, and there's new, new technology and circumcision that are shown to be equally effective as possibly the less effective vaccine kind of thing. And, and so a kind of a bird in the hand versus the long term. I just wonder um, how, how that momentum is, is being sustained, how broad it is. So let me, let me start here if I can um, and, and say, first of all, that um, you know, one of the problems and one of the reasons I talked about the toolkit is, you know, it's fine to stand up and say, well, circumcision works great, you know, and so just everybody ought to have it. But not necessarily everybody wants it. And, one of the things about, uh, about choice is that you want to, you know, have different choices. And certainly when you're talking about young women, um, you know, a preventative strategy that can protect them under any circumstances is really, is really what you need. And that's why vaccines would be so important for that constituency. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, in a, in a sense, one of the problems is we and others, the way we got vaccines up the agenda was by promoting how important they were. And then when there's a failure, it becomes you know, above the fold, front page news, 
which is not true for like a malaria vaccine. There's been 40-odd failures, you know, and if it's ever reported at all, it's reported in page 40. So in a sense, we made a mistake. But I think what happened was that that was mostly, if you looked at it, the, um, you know, the dismay was from all of this attention the reporters were giving it and not understanding where we are. Product development is a, about failing. It's about failing quickly. It's about going through learning from these because you can only do it in humans. That's the, that's the problem since we don't have a perfect animal model. And, and, you know, this was an unreasonable expectation that your second candidate would have been a home run. I mean, I, at IAVI, we actually built our program assuming that Merck candidate would fail. So we had hoped there would be some signal, but we certainly didn't build it as if that was going to be the, the vaccine to, you know, end vaccines. And so I think really the challenge is, is resetting expectations for the field. And, and what you describe is exactly why it's so hard for us. How do you, you know, a politician stands up and says, I'm only going to be here for a few years. I can hold up a baby. I can, you know, treat somebody and show the Lazarus effect. That's really exciting to me. Do I really want to invest in something that I'm not going to see the result for? you know, for five or 10 years when I'm not in office anymore and getting people to buy in. But that is why it's important for government to think over these long-term issues. Um, on, the, on the clinical trial side, we started out with um, having more women volunteer than men. You remember we said this at that previous sessions here. And then by the time we got actually at the end of the trial, women ended up being the, 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 the minority. And we had to go and really look carefully why that was. And so the women were motivated, but then they had to deal with permission issues with their husband. They couldn't get pregnant during the trial, which was a big issue and for, a, for a lot of women. They had issues in terms of care and, and a whole range of other issues that allowed us then to go back and focus on engaging women and doing everything we could to encourage them and support groups. And, and so now we've got very good gender balance in our trials. And, and not only is that true in Africa, but also in India, we, you know, again, took the lessons learned and, and brought those over. So um, it is a huge priority for us. And, and um, you know, one of the questions that people ask is, what about young women? And we haven't felt there was a candidate that was interesting and exciting enough to, to move into. But I think that's going to be a huge priority and is going to raise a whole bunch of issues in, on, the, on the ethics side. But, you know, you're really going to want to be going into adolescence in the future. And, 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 and how do we do that and not wait till you know, after the vaccine's approved, and then you got to go back and it's delayed. Um, in terms of the Obama priorities, I, you know, uh, I would leave that to my, my team, who's much more familiar now um, with, with, with the, the whole range of that program. But I think one of the challenges, one of the things that we see in front of us is that, is that, you know, AIDS is going through a period of reassessment. It's going to go through a period of reassessment, both treatment versus prevention. And I, and I used it versus. It shouldn't be. It should be treatment and prevention. But there is going to be, in a, in a world of limited assets, some thought process across the two. And then also the broader health areas, because AIDS has gotten enormous attention. And I think this is going to be really important for all of us to keep our eye on the prize. And I think if we just hold the dikes back and say we don't want to be part of the conversation, it's all what Jeff Sachs says is expand the pie. That's the only answer. you got a problem. We're going to have to engage in those debates to make sure that the debates go well. And, and there was recently a study, for example, a, a G-Finder study that was supported by the Gates Foundation looking at priorities across different diseases. And, you know, I, I personally didn't like the way that study was done because of some methodological issues. But, you know, that study came out and said, well, you know, basically much too much money is going to AIDS and not enough to these other diseases. There were some big methodologic problems. But I think we're going to see more and more of this and how we put that to context and deal with it is going to be a, a critical priority over the next year or two. Yes. Pre Sloan working in Russia on HIV AIDS control. As you know, in Russia, the main transmission is through injecting drug use. Are you doing any work particularly with injecting drug users? And secondly, is it a different mechanism, uh, the transmission from a cellular standpoint? <coughs> So, excellent question and um, a complicated one, it turns out. So, years ago, people believed that um, certain types of the virus, so called clades, species of the virus, had adapted to be heterosexually transmitted. And so, people believed that the B strain, which was in the US and Europe, was mostly spread by blood. And, and that blood included um, uh, having uh, um, men who have sex with men, where there's some you know, uh, mucosa that's very thin, and there's some bleeding with, with anal intercourse, et cetera. So, um, and, and they said that, that clade C, for example, which is the one that's spreading mostly in the South, is adapted for heterosexual transmission. And 
So some studies came out of Harvard on that, and, and it turned out that those weren't able to be reproduced. But now there's a whole new set of data that's actually coming out to suggest that, in fact, there are differences in transmission. There are differences in virulence between the different, um, the different strains. And so it may be that they're slightly different in terms of what's being transmitted and how. There was data in Thailand that suggested that, you know, the, the type B was transmitted through for IV drug users, type E was transmitted heterosexually, and it was almost like two epidemics that were moving, you know, at the same time, although there was some mixing. Um, at the end of the day, we need protection against all different types. We've been working mostly in, 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 uh, in heterosexual um, epidemics, and the reason we've been doing that is, you know, our primary focus was to try to make sure Africa was included, and that's what most of the epidemic is there. But there is an enormous need, and a number of the trials are going on in, in IV drug users. That was true with the VaxGen trial. It's true with some of the work that's going on in in the uh, Thai trial, and, and so I think the answer is we've got to look at both, and we need to make sure we have a vaccine ultimately that does work in both. The other thing is is that the inoculum is much higher in, a, in intravenous drug use than it would be. I mean, a normal heterosexual transmission is probably just one or two viruses getting through. It's a very small inoculum that actually makes it through, and that's some new science that came through recently, whereas when you're obviously giving intravenously, it's a different game. Much, probably much harder to protect. Yeah. Some of your partner scientists from Africa and elsewhere. My question is, how do you build a, how do you build a better constituency, a more vocal and visible constituency, for science from Africa and the other partner countries? Um, I think for much of the debate, that's been absent here. You don't have visible, prominent personalities that are pushing on this particular very important sort of set of opportunities. Um, and if there were, it would change the context significantly here for the way the issues are debated. So I wanted to ask you to talk about that. And if I may add also, you, you opened the door here in your suggestions around where we are now in this with the president's program. And there's this, we're, we're at a new moment in debate around US global health strategies and and <clears throat> I wanted you to say a little bit more as to how much has to change in the way we think and, and articulate our priorities looking forward because certainly you seem to be moving in that direction that there's, there, is a, there is a game changer that has happened here with the economic recession, with the change of administrations. <coughs> there's a recalculus going on and how do you see that moving forward? So it's really two questions. So, yeah. <laughs> Where are the champions coming from in Africa? Can you identify the, you know, yeah. the institutions? And so forth? I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. Starting off on the champion issues, I, I don't have a magical answer. And the reason I don't is exactly the question you asked before, which is, you know, how prominent do you want the discussions to be? Let me give you an example. So in Kenya, which is the first place we really started working, um, we brought the first AIDS vaccine designed against strains that were in Africa. And there were three scientists there who were prominent, doing the work, very well trained. And the, you know, the Kenyan paper had you know headlines, you know, three scientists, three musketeers, you know, going to save Kenya, you know. And and again, we you know because of the, this unreasonable expectations, we've really gotten a little shy on how prominent do you want it to be? Do we do we dial it back? And you know, do you want leaders to come pounding on the table and say we demand this? This is critical, you know, because then you again. Re re you know, have this problem with expectations. So we're, we're struggling with what the right balance is between you have to have a voice, you've got to have people saying it, you've got to keep it on the agenda, but you also you know, don't want to be put back in a position where if there is another failure of a candidate, which there will be, people don't say, oh my God, it's hopeless, this is the end of the world. And so how you get that balance right is really the tough issue. Um, you know, the other part of it is how much of it is at the political leadership level and how much of it is at the scientist level and then the community level. And I, I think it needs to be at all of those. And so working for ways to connect those pieces um, is absolutely critical. But if you go back, um, you know, five or seven years ago, there was the first AU only, AU summit on AIDS. And we went to that summit. There was a 50-page document. It didn't mention research. It didn't mention AIDS vaccines. It was the, the document for Africa. And so one of the challenges is how do you how do you kind of get it in there and, and keep it in there? Because again, they're not thinking long term, they're thinking short term, as everybody does around the world. So 
I think that's, you know, I don't have a magic answer for that. So the, the thing we're doing this afternoon is we're bringing some very prominent, wonderful researchers to come and talk about it and talk about the effects. I love hearing South Africa. There was a really interesting person. This is a, you know, you can't measure this stuff, but we set up a, a program to do um, uh, quality assurance, quality controls around the laboratories in South Africa. The other labs in the area thought this is really interesting. These labs have that. They began to share them. They began to look at them. The whole, all the labs lifted up quality in the area. How do you measure that? But, but that's what we're really looking for is that, is that effect that occurs, you know, much broader. And we've tried to document some of it. There's an article out there on, on um, you know, science in, in Africa. But, you know, how do you, how, do you, how do you really capture that type of stuff? And to go back to your question, it's not our job. Our job is to find an AIDS vaccine. So I've got to be really careful if I'm out there saying, gee, I'd like to be working on, you know, better tertiary education for scientists or, you know, other things I can comment on it. But... We can't invest in it, you know, although we've actually, we've toyed with the idea if we could get money to do fellowships and things like that, would we be able, is there a way we could align it with our, with what we're doing to, to, to help make a difference in there? So I think in a sense, we'd like to be part of the conversation, but we can't, we can't be the, you know, the leaders of the conversation because it really isn't in our mission. Um, in terms of the, the timing, I think it's an extraordinary time to, to um, be thinking about this because we are going to have a rethink of foreign aid. Um, you know, times have changed completely. For, I mean, look at the, the, um, the uh, Bretton Wood institutions, you know. I mean, the world's changed. The World Bank, for example, is not well set up to do social programs. We know that. I mean, they're not set up to do, I mean, lending is not the right mechanism to deal with, you know, education and a number of these other issues. So we've got a lot of rethink that has to go on now, and, and, and I think it's an important time to, you know, really ask the question, you know, what is development going to look like in the next 50 years? What are the requirements going to be? What are these countries going to need? How are we going to move them? And what type of relationships going to be required? And I think even for the United States, the idea that we're a knowledge-based society, that we need science education and, you know, better trained people and better workforce. I mean, as you're hearing it, although it's pretty scary where we rank among OECD countries, and as you know, with China and India, are out there, you know, producing massive numbers of PhDs in engineering and other scientists, and, and they're going to be forming relationships more and more with the developing world. So I think it's a completely shifting landscape, and for our own survival as a, as a country that's leading in some science and technology, we're going to have to do it for ourselves. But this type of dialogue, this type of engagement can keep us, you know, in the forefront and bring something that others can't bring. And that, to me, is the most interesting part. You go to these countries around the world that have tried to do the same innovation, set of innovation, you know, corridors and all the other things. And they haven't been able to magically reproduce what happened in, you know, in Silicon you know, Valley and Silicon Alley and, you know, the Cambridge Corridor and others. And whatever that je ne sais quoi, you know, is something we ought to be thinking about for developing countries and, and these problems. Um, because, there, you know, some of these problems aren't going to be solved without scientific innovation. Some are. Some are just, you know, we've got the innovations, we just have to get them out there. But... There's a lot of them that require much better innovation, and boy, if we could get focused on that, we can really make a big change. Great. Well, one more question. Laura E. Alm, I'm a freelance reporter for Deutsche Welle. One of them is to if you could talk a little bit more about this potential vaccine and the an antibodies that seem to have some promise here. And the other thing would be, uh, you did talk about um, if people are on antiretroviral treatment, that they may still be transmitting, because my understanding was that if they're on it, it just knocks down the viral load so low that they aren't transmitting. So in a sense, another solution which would probably break the economies of most countries is to pay for everyone gets the antiretrovirals. That just knocks down that virus. You prevent the infection, and you know that stops. That's a preventive treatment. So on the, on the second first, there was, a, um, there was a paper published in The Lancet by a team coming out of WHO that, that suggested treatment for prevention. <coughs> and they did some mathematical modeling, and what they said is, well, if we treat early, we treat hard, and we constantly test so that we're constantly identifying new people, we could do this. Now, they did a mathematical model. What it hasn't been is really tested, and, and whether it will be, and we're able to do that and financially sustain it is a, is a different question. But... The point I was making is that even people who have very low viral load, you can still isolate um, a virus from semen because that's a, a protected um, compartment. Now, at the end, it looks like there's some data that's coming out, and it looks like when you're on treatment, it does reduce transmission. So whether it reduces zero or not, how much goes on. One of the problems is that the, 
probably the highest risk transmission time is actually within a few weeks of being infected, when you're not going to be HIV positive, when people are not going to necessarily know there, and would be unlikely to be under treatment. So, you know, you'd have to, I mean, almost put the entire population on all the time, catch every new infection. It's, it's very hard to do. But, you know, people will study this and, and understand better what it role it'll play in public policy. On, on the antibody-based vaccines, there isn't a vaccine yet. What's exciting is that the way other vaccines work is they produce neutralizing antibodies. And if we could find antibodies that were very potent and that would be easy to produce, then, of course, you'd want to take those candidates right into people. The, the, the four antibodies that have been known for 15 years are kind of weird. They have long arms. They're very hard to know how to produce them. Um, they reach um, you know, behind uh, to the virus to where they bind. Into the, onto, the, onto the cell, and that's how they work. That's why they can be conserved across strains. Nobody succeeded in making an immunogen, that is a thing that you would inject that would make those antibodies. We know people can make them, because people have them, but we didn't know how to make them. Uh, the hope is that some of these new ones that are coming out will not only be broadly neutralized and conserved, but will be much easier to produce. We'll have structures that are simpler, and if that's the case, then rapidly turn those into uh, vaccine prototypes. And, as soon as we have um, a, an immunogen that will give us, uh, our, our bar is 50% moderately resistant to neutralized strains. If we can neutralize 50% of those, then we'll fast track it into humans. And so, you know, we're hoping for that. But we are waiting for a breakthrough on that, and we don't know when that's going to occur. But I'm, I'm optimistic, given all the new tools and all the exciting science that's going on. Hi. Uh one year, a couple of years ago, there's uh, the the Chinese American David uh, David Hu. He, uh, uh, I mean, he uh, he he did uh, something. Uh, at that time, it looks like good job for the uh, uh, the uh, AIDS. So, uh, the, you know, the, the 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 wine put something with it, the wine get something. I mean, uh, what I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing it. Ah, uh, yeah, wonder it's uh, is there there's uh, there's a doctor here. Uh, in the United States, uh, it's a couple of years ago. I, I haven't heard anything uh, after that. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, it looks like he did a good job a couple of years ago. Like the, he found something specifically for the uh, the cure the AIDS. I wonder if uh, right now nobody talking about it. It's it's uh, that 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 thing's work. The wine, the red wine, was put into something and it can totally cure the uh, AIDS. Oh, I, yeah, this, uh, I don't know. I mean, you said David Ho initially. We work with David Ho. Oh, yeah, David Ho, David Ho, yeah. We supported yeah. him on AIDS vaccines. I don't know any work he's done on wine. There are some fabulous compounds in wine that do uh, act as antioxidants. They're very good protecting. Of course, you have to drink a lot of wine, and some people have argued that. And I like wine, so I'm happy to try to drink a lot of wine. But um, I haven't heard anything in terms of its role in, in, in curing HIV. And one of the problems is that you know, given the magnitude of this disease around the world and the problems associated with it and the lack of good treatments and, and um, things that can cure it, people have tried many, many different treatments that show different, you know, effects in different places. But um, we know we've got some reasonably good drugs for it now. In fact, there's more drugs for HIV than for all the viruses put together. And I think that's going to be the main, mainstay of treatment, at least until we um, come up either with a way to cure it or a, or a better way to prevent it. Well, I mean, it, it's a really interesting point. I actually wrote a, an editorial a few years ago um, in Newsweek on the relationship. This was about uh, avian influenza and, you know, avian influenza vaccine attempts and, and the relations to HIV vaccines. It's very similar in what's needed. And what do I mean by that? There's obviously been a big market um, for flu vaccines, but not as big as you'd think. Um, I used to, years ago, be on the company a company board of a traditional egg-based flu manufacturer. It was the second largest manufacturer in the world. And, and we used to have a discussion around the boardroom table that 
went something like this. Flu vaccines are a commodity vaccine. You know, it's relatively inexpensive. We know we need better technology, but to do that, we're going to have to invest massive amounts of money, and there's no justification because you won't get it back. And, you know, since, you're, since your other competitors will be able to sell the vaccine very inexpensively, there's no way to do that. So people didn't invest in new technologies. Then when avian influenza came, all of a sudden there was panic and there was an investment in new technologies. A lot of the investment went into building more egg-based plants because uh, the idea was is they could then produce vaccine and, and have adequate quantity. Um, egg-based vaccines are terrible. I mean, it's a 50-year-old technology. Obviously, if there was a massive avian influenza and it got into the bird stock, you'd have no eggs. So, I mean, it's, it's not your ideal way of doing it. Um, there are new technologies that could be used. Um, the problem is, is how do you really accelerate them? Now, the market will take care of it. You can argue let the market do it, but the market's going to do it through venture capital, and, and those are going to be much slower approaches than what they would be if there was a Manhattan Project type approach or funding stream. And I think now we're in exactly that thought process around um, uh, avian H1N1 uh, Mexico City 2009. So one of the questions is, WHO had already chosen its trivalent strains. There are three strains normally in a flu vaccine. There are two influenza A and one influenza B. They've already chosen them. Manufacturers were producing it. All of a sudden, this epidemic occurs, and everybody says, wait a second, you know, what do we want to do about that? So there's a couple of possibilities. One, you could just drop this new um, flu strain in. So one of the A's, take out the old one, put the new one in. This particular virus doesn't grow very well on eggs, so you'd have to get one that was close to it, not exactly. And then you could go ahead and make a trivalent. The world can make about 450 million doses of trivalent vaccine. And that would be ready a little bit late, but it would be ready for the season. Um, the other choice would be they could say, well, instead of doing a trivalent, let's make a monovalent. And so we'll make just the H1N1, you know, Mexico City 2009. And then we could make uh, 1.3 billion doses, let's say. And in fact, if you put adjuvants, you might even be able to stretch it further. Now, you wouldn't protect against B, you wouldn't protect against other A strains that were circulating, and so that's a huge policy decision to be made. And, and the question we were talking about before, which is really interesting, is if you're, in 1918, what happened was there was a little blip around this time of year, and then in the flu season, it came roaring in, just roaring in. And during that particular pandemic, the estimates are 50 to 100 million people were killed, but the point is they were killed in places that didn't normally have lots of flu deaths, like Africa. We don't know what the numbers were. but So if that happened again, who's supplying vaccines for Africa? Who's thinking about that and, and for other poor countries? And there, there just aren't adequate supplies. And so what's the mechanisms to do that? How do we think about that? You need new technologies that can produce large quantities. And, and the same thing, by the way, goes for avian influenza. If it was to shift over, as you know, they've stockpiled you know, egg-based avian influenza vaccines, but if there's a little antigenic shift, it's probably not going to work. So what we need to do is have a, a, a thought process, again, on how we prepare for these types of issues. What's the role of the private sector? What's the role of the public sector? How do you drive the science for the developing world? Again, you know, Zambia is not sitting there saying, let's, let's try to make, you know, better vaccines for flu. They can't. They don't have the capabilities. So, you know, in a sense, this is where they would be really dependent upon the West, and, and are we thinking about it in the best ways? And I, you know, I think not. And so these are issues that, that really need to be dealt with. And they have answers, but, you know, there are trade-offs on these. Yeah. Uh, where are we on uh, microbicides? And I gather it was very promising about a year ago, and then it didn't come through, and where do you see it? Well, there, I mean, you know, there, there are promising microbicides. There's a product that just um, uh, went through a small phase two trial that had about 30 percent efficacy. It didn't, it didn't reach statistical significance, but if you looked at the sub-analysis of the study, it looked like it would if it had larger numbers. Every bit of the data pointed to that it was going to work. Then there's a whole movement now to, to second generation microbicides, and those are going to be microbicides that are actually using the antiretroviral drugs, either used as gels or even on rings that may be sustained release. And those are now moving forward. So I think we will end up with, with microbicides of, of one type or another. Whether they will be, you know, as useful and, and useful to all populations or not, I think only time will tell. There's been a huge problem with um, um, how adherent people are to using them, even in trials, you know, because at least the ones that require daily use 
you know, not everybody is able to prepare for their sexual encounters and take the time to do it and have supportive partners, et cetera, et cetera. So, again, a very important part of our toolkit, um, but, but um, you know, alone is probably not going to solve the problem. Good. Thank you all. Thank you so much.